Should I talk now? <laughs> All right. So thanks for inviting me to come to my own department and talk about what I teach you guys all the time. Um, I'm actually excited, and one of the reasons I think that's a good idea is because a lot of times we will uh, uh, be teaching you guys for years, and you still won't know what it is we do. And conversely, uh, we often we've read all your stuff, but we forget. So it's useful to have these things. So I titled this um, "Using Tattoo to Explore Human Nature." Uh, the goal of the tattoo research that I do is to write a book about tattooing and human nature. So I'll give you a bit, a bit of a, a, a gloss of that. Uh, Inking of Immunity is the name of the project that's been going on for a while now. And just as a real quick aside, this project started as a sort of a, a side project. When I started my lab, um, I started Hburn to emulate the kind of lab that I worked in as a grad student that enabled me to have an interdisciplinary group of people who I could talk about ideas with and then who would help me. I actually did it in an evolutionary psychology lab, so I combined uh, sort of the models. And so when I came here, I invited people to uh, join my lab, but then I was like, okay, what are we going to do? So the fireside study of the tattoo, making your community both came out of that. Uh, these were not my main projects. They have become my main projects. These were side projects that I used to get students interested, and they caught fire and became the main project. So uh, currently, I have a National Science Foundation uh, grant. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit about that toward the end. I'm going to walk you through her uh, when I, when uh, Elliot asked me to give this, and then Tommy reached out. Tommy works in my lab enough to know what I do. Is that, you know what you're talking about. She said, talk about your tattooing research, talk about how you use evolutionary theory, give us a story from the field, basically everything I offered. She said, yes, do a little bit of everything. <laughs> so there's 43 slides. I'm getting to all of them, don't worry. <laughs> but uh, let's go with slide number one. Okay, so the first reason that I study tattooing is not because I love tattooing, obviously I do think it's interesting, but because tattooing is a great uh, portal through which we can look at all of the sub-disciplines of anthropology and in fact, a lot of other things too. So, I mean, this is a biological response to getting a tattoo, right? Uh, and he's actually giving me a saliva sample right there. We can look at the material remains. This is a tattooing kit from Moundville recovered uh, by Jim Knight, I believe. Uh, this is uh, the Sama, the, the, the ceremony after getting a Samoan tattoo. This picture is not as big as I had hoped uh, it could be, and I got distracted looking for a cool picture. And then, of course, we have our, this is one of your fellow grad students who graduated a few years ago uh, with a literal linguistic communication. And we can study all the, the sub-disciplines of anthropology through tattooing. Oh, wait, this is, I edited this. Okay, anyway. Um, I did have some cool new pictures, but oh well. So one of the things that I want us to think about is why study tattooing, right? Like I said, you can look at all four sub-disciplines, but you can do that with a lot of things, right? So as a biological anthropologist, what can tattooing allow us to explore? That's important, right? Um, well, things that are popular may seem cheap and easy to study, but the fact that they're popular means there's some salience for the human experience, and that makes it meaningful, right? So how popular is tattooing? One in three Americans is now tattooed, right? And yet, at the same time, there's all sorts of uh, headlines out there and studies that continue to be done about this basically mainstream activity suggesting you might be a bad person because you get tattooed, right? Tattoos make you look promiscuous. Tattoos may be associated with criminal behavior, right? And we've seen these for a long, long time. So understanding that tension is important. 
Tattoos are wounds that are purposely that we purposely inflict on ourselves, uh, and they increase the susceptibility to infection. So I'll show you a couple examples of tattoos as actual wounds, right? So this is actually a picture I took in Ecuador uh, in 2001, and they're tattooing outside. You can see there's no gloves or any of the sanitary things that we associate with tattoo with healthy tattooing now, and not necessarily this guy, but the kinds of consequences you can experience might be, well, not that, that's actually a uh, an infection on a tattoo, not an infected tattoo. How do I know? That's my leg. That's a fire ant sting on my Samoan tattoo. I can show you the scar later. Uh, this is not me, but this is uh, an infected tattoo. So you see the whole tattoo and all the pigmented area and the same thing with that. These can lead to sepsis and be really deadly. Tattooing has been practiced for millennia. Most of us are familiar with Utsi, the 5,500-year-old mummy with 63 tattoos. Uh, fun fact, right? We often think of these as tattoos. Um, it's kind of arguable whether they really are tattoos, right? What is a tattoo? Is, is a tattoo something that uh, you purposely put under the skin for the pigment and the decoration? Or what if you just slight up, uh, make a cut and then keep rubbing some material in that cut to ease pain or something, and rubbing that material leaves a mark, right? Does that become a tattoo, right? So 63 marks on here, and we know from recent experience, experimental archaeology that they were done using a puncture method and not a slicing method because of the shapes of the, the scars and the tattoo, but they still are associated with pain sites. We know this from uh, a lot of studies that have been done on Lucy. Uh, Mike Spatana and I just did a medical anthropology of tattooing, a cross-cultural survey, and looked at tons and tons of evidence. And what is emerging is tons of, there's tons of evidence of medical tattooing, but a lot of them, when you see tattoos that are over pain sites, you have to ask yourself, why do you need a tattoo to show someone where to alleviate pain if you're in fucking pain? You know where the spot is, right? You don't need a, oh, wait, where am I in pain again? Oh, there's my tattoo, that's right. No, you know where you're in pain. But if they are going back to that spot over and over again and putting some medication in there, it, it will leave a mark, right? So similar to, uh, we see a lot in Africa, a lot of what, they, what, what we call pigmented cicatries or cicatrix or whatever the plural is, which are incisions that have material rubbed into them. They often turn into keloid scars, which then have a pigmentation to them when materials rubbed into them. But here's the cooler, even cooler thing than that. This is 5,500 years ago. This is the oldest direct evidence we have for tattooing. We have lots of indirect evidence. So the kinds of material that we found that have been recovered at Moundville has been recovered all over the world, including some potential uh, shell with pigment in them from the Blombos Cave region of South Africa. If anybody's familiar with that site, you know that is taking the date from 5,500 years old to as much as 200,000 years, right? Blombos Cave is a site where they're looking at very, very early emergence of human cultural behavior, and it's possible that tattooing is that old, right? Tattooing was even more dangerous before the modern era. Um, so the reason I study tattooing is because I encountered this quote when I was an undergraduate. When I was an undergraduate senior in class in body modification, we read the famous research uh, publication that talked about body modification. That particular issue, the editors of it, wanted to emulate cultural anthropology. So it seems very anthropological and it inspired a movement, right? So we have, since the publication of that, uh, an increase in uh, tattooing and body modifications around the world. A lot of people put their finger on that publication as one of the reasons. But people like Lyle Tuttle were already making tattooing popular again. He's part of what's called the Second Renaissance. Lyle Tuttle became famous in the 70s for tattooing. Janis Joplin, Cher, Joan Baez. He was on the cover of Rolling Stone. And he, in fact, had gone and gotten some of the traditional uh, tattoos, and including the Samoan Pea, and got an infection and had to go get antibiotics. Um, and when you read about getting the Samoan Pea in the research 
magazine or the research publication, uh, there's some really intense experiences. And I'll show you some pictures of what that looks like in just a second. But the final, the very last piece of a payoff uh, is in the naval. And in the, the story that they read, the naval uh, hemorrhaged by the guy who was getting it, right? So it's like, oh my God, this is amazingly terrible. And it's very, very dramatic. Uh, I've seen a lot of chaos. I've never seen anybody lose like their guts, right? Uh, but uh, nonetheless, uh, the lack of antibiotics uh, caused him to start thinking about uh, this paradigm, right? And I've got to have a little circle here over the, the quote. He said, tattooing has always been associated with warriors. It's possible that early man figured out that men who were tattooed had a better survival rate from wounds because a tattoo is a wound. Maybe it develops in the antibody system. Now, he got this idea from an older tattoo artist from Vancouver named Curly, who had figured all those warriors stabbing each other with spear points that may have been fire hardened would leave char in under people's skin. Uh, we know from Shonen that fire hardened spears are 400,000 years old. That technology is older than Homo sapiens. So the potential for people to figure out tattooing technology can be pushed back to Homo erectus, right? Um, so, but when I saw this as an undergrad, I thought, oh, what a great idea. Surely someone has tested this. Um, and uh, they have it, it turns out, which is why I'm showing you this today. And what I added up there at the top and what I want to talk about in just a second is when I start talking about how we do the studies, right? And what the theory is, um, we use evolutionary theory, but we test two different types, right? And so thinking about how tattoos may influence our health would be a theory drawing, or would be a hypothesis drawing on natural selection theory, that tattoos may hone our bodies, right? That ta people who get tattoos and survive uh, them or have their antibodies uh, enhanced and maybe uh, have get benefits from that would then the, the reasoning goes be either one, uh, out surviving other people, or two, uh, more attractive as reproductive partners, or something that would lead to the genes being passed on at a higher rate, right? So that's a natural selection hypothesis about tattooing, that they are honing your immune system, right? And that's important because adaptive immunity is not well understood. So one of the ways that I think about tattooing is as a stressor, right? So when we study stressors from an evolutionary perspective, the easiest way to think about that natural selection owns us to be more fit, it's easier to think about exercise, right? If you think about exercise, exercise is something that you do to stress your body. And if you've gone to the gym recently, and it's the first time you've been to the gym in a while, you probably felt worse for going to the gym than you did before, right? So over time, there has to be some adjustment, right? And when we deviate from homeostasis, we call that stress, right? Now, over your life course, right, obviously, if you're going to the gym a lot, and you go from the gym kicking your ass to the gym making you feel better, the homeostatic set points for your stress response have to have shifted, right? So your body is not going into fight or flight mode every single time and shutting down all your non-essential systems and freaking out every time you go to the gym. Does anybody know why? Why does your body know that? And this is the key. This is the key to all of this. What is the main engine or the main, I don't know, computer center, the CPU for your stress response system. You know, this one. It's just Friday, so it's 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 asleep right now. Wake it up. Well, even broader. Your brain, your brain, your brain, your brain, right? You're thinking, I am not running from a zebra. I'm going to the gym. I am not about to die. I am about to get healthy, right? Your brain is telling your body, your immune system, how to respond, right? Allostasis, this concept allostasis, um, means homeostasis or equilibrium or stability with change. So it's the idea that we have set points 
for these systems, but they have to be responsive to life history and life changes. So your set points change over time, right? New set point, right? This, uh, and when we talk about allostatic load, you heard that term probably, allostatic load is like the accumulation of stress, right? So sometimes there's too much stress, we refer to that as overload. Right, and we try to understand it. And how do we try to understand it? We try to understand it by finding ways to measure it, and then compare it to the uh, to all the the mechanisms within the system. Right. So, what are the mechanisms in stress response? Cortisol, DHEA, sympathetic and parasympathetic, all of these things, and they're all doing this. Right, making it really difficult to understand. And of course, that's where we anthropologists come in. Because not only do we love a good messy flow chart of mechanisms, but what's outside of all of this that we also love? Bring brains on. Soaking in a bath of culture. And we love that because it makes it even messier, right? So I want to understand the changing set points of our stress system within a cultural matrix, which means I have to understand if the stress is good or bad, how it's being evaluated, and then I have to understand how the immune system and the endocrine system interact together to know good from bad and to be able to change that. I feel shitty after the gym to I feel awesome. I mean, tattoo, aren't they sexy? Right? You know, all that stuff, right? Nobody does that though, right? <laughs> My son got a new tattoo. He was like, I just, you know, sort of sitting in class going, Oh, and the stretches and peek out. Nobody does that, though, right? I'm like dying laughing. I'm like, yeah, nobody does that. What are you talking about? Okay. So the upshot of this is really like, can cultural practices improve our immune system, right? Besides that, we know exercise can. Uh, do we have other things that do that, right? And how do we detect stability if it's changing? Right? How do we know what a set point is for any given person, right? So we we can, like this guy over here is trying to meditate and understand his stress uh, levels. And so we might look at exercise, right? So these guys who are heavily tattooed uh, uh, may get a benefit from that. And then you have an athlete who's heavily tattooed. So we have all these layers of culture, right? And the reason I show you these athletes, the reason I talk about this is because we do have an exercise science. We have kinesiology, and so we have models for how to understand culturally uh, salient and personally important stress and how it impacts us, right? So we took a model from exercise science. This is a Ted Peak video in North Port, still there. That is Brittany Howard. She is in Alabama Shakes. She was not in our tattoo study, but that is her real Alabama tattoo. That is Michaela Howell's hand. She did not hold it for this study, but she did later. That is what the uh, salad, the cryobile that they would spit in looks like. And Johnny Dominguez ran this study. She was a master's student at the time and was one of our outstanding thesis at the college department and university level. So yay us, we rocked it. And uh, what she did is collect data at Seneca and Leeds to test this idea using the exercise model. And the idea that we uh, used is, is this idea that again, uh, immune, uh, we can look at the immune system using biomarkers uh, in the same way that exercise scientists look at them. So exercise scientists are interested in this, uh, this antibody, immunoglobulin A, as a marker of inflammation related to upper respiratory tract infections because it is uh, one of the main or frontline defenses against gastrointestinal and respiratory illness, right? So in other words, like you're breathing and eating, like all that coronavirus you're breathing in right now squeezed in together, it's your IgA that's fighting it, right? So give your IgA a fist bump right now because you need it. And when you get sick right after finals, it's because your IgA probably drops. Right, it's produced at a high rate and highly conserved, but it's really susceptible to stress, so it drops really quickly and raises really quickly, which is why we can measure it. Now we measure it in saliva, right? Which means we're measuring circulating antibody. We're not measuring at the spot of the tattoo, right? 
So in other words, what we're measuring is when you're stressed, your whole body system goes into response. And what is happening in the rest of the body is some indication of what might be happening at the site where, where, where we think the body thinks there's some invasion happening there and it mobilizes uh, all the uh, antibodies throughout the bloodstream and then it should localize there, right? All right, so we collect a saliva sample right before or right at the beginning of a tattoo right at the end of a tattoo in the original studies, uh, record the amount of time the tattoo takes, and then we have a survey where we collect lifetime tattooing experience. And this is how we can compare uh, how tattooing has potentially primed someone's immune system. So in other words, like exercise, if you had the experience of it, we would expect your body to be used to it and to see an effect, right? What's the effect that we would normally see? So usually when, because this is highly conserved and produced at a high rate, when you are stressed, when you are sick, the levels will drop. The reason that they immediately drop when you're under stress is because fight or flight turns off non-essential systems so that you can deal with the immediate needs. Now it might seem like the immune system is pretty important when you're in danger, but we're talking about acute danger. Your, your, your systems are non-specific. They have no idea what is out there, what you're dealing with. So I always toggle to uh, the lion example that Robert Sapolsky uses in Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. How many of you are familiar with that book? Okay, one person, so the rest of you need to read that book. We need to get back to assigning that book. It is a classic of uh, stress science and great for a uh, biocultural medical anthropology student to have on their shelf. Does anybody know why zebras don't get ulcers? Okay, really quickly. Yeah, why? What? The tooth is getting eaten. Well, okay. If they're not getting eaten. If they're not, the reason zebras don't, the living zebras don't get ulcers. Not at all. The opposite, actually. You know who's constantly under stress? You. Find yourself. But all of you, right? The, the, the zebras don't get ulcers because once they escape the zebra, they forget about, I'm sorry, once they escape the lion, they forget about the lion. They go back to eating and fucking and doing zebra shit, right? It, because what stopped when they were running was um, reproductive stuff, like I, I said that on purpose, right? Uh, digestion, growth, like all you need to do is survive right now. Like you can have a big zebra, like a big lion chunk taken out of you, doesn't matter, don't heal that right now, just, just run. I don't know if anybody's ever hurt themselves uh, when they're playing sports, right? You get that analgesia, so I, I say he's limping, but he probably doesn't even feel it, he's still running. I broke my toe playing soccer, didn't feel it, so I stopped and I went, Whoa. Right? Just all of a sudden. So similarly, zebra doesn't feel it and it stops and it's like, what's it running for? Oh, fuck it. Meanwhile, but the difference is with humans, we're going like, oh my God, where, where did it go? Where, where are my kids? Oh my God, where's mom? I hope Elliot's okay. I wonder if it's not Jamie yet, right? Like we're just worrying, worrying, worrying. Like, I hope I passed this test. I hope I passed this test, right? So, we want to know how much training your immune system has had for the tattoo, right? Because um, we're looking at how you respond to it either being a novel stressor that you have to shut everything down for right away, or it's a stressor you encounter a lot, your brain has retrained it to not turn off. You get any new tattoo, you get these all the time. You don't need to turn your stress response off. So we would expect immunosuppression, right? Or a drop in immune response for people getting a new tattoo and no change or elevation. Thank you. This is me. Oh, this is, I forgot I have a slide explaining everything I just said. Okay. So, and, and in this initial study, for the most part, as cortisol went up, during tattooing, cortisol is a stress hormone. Um, immunoglobulin did go down, right? Supporting that hypothesis. 
right? And we're comparing cute little, how many of you have this tattoo? And Josh is getting this one this weekend. Just kidding. Uh, I should get that. After all, I make a joke about it. It'd be funny if I actually had it. Compared to people with like, in this case, I think uh, we had from zero to 300 hours of tattooing in this sample, right? So when we look at this first chart, right, uh, this is just the post-test sample, right? So what we did is we compared, the, we controlled for the pre-test. So all we're looking at is the change since the pre-test. These are IGA levels. This is the low experience group. So we dichotomized them by how much tattoo experience they had to be able to make the chart. So I think this is like, I don't know, zero to 20 hours or something. And then this is, this is more, I can't remember where we didn't split. But what you see is uh, in both cases, uh, the, the high tattoo experience groups, uh, the immunoglobulin A at the end of the tattoo is higher than the other group. And they it went, the, 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 set, the session length, Right here, it, it, it still went up. Oh yeah, okay. So this is the low, this is the high experience group. So in both cases, the high experience group was higher than the low experience group. Yeah, this one confuses me. I always throw, get thrown off each time I explain it. So we published this. This was a sample of about 29 mostly women. Went viral, my first viral study. Thousands and thousands of articles. Thousands, I'm not joking. This study shows lots of tattoos might be good for your health. Here's how having a lot of tattoos is making you healthier. Um, sorry, Ma, getting a lot of tattoos. This made me cringe so much. It was so embarrassing. Um, this is my favorite, though. Because <laughs> it's true, right? 29 mostly women. Right, I was I was proud that the study got the, the the attention that it did, but suddenly what I thought was sort of a, a size that a fun fun little funsy study gained traction. All these people with autoimmune disease writing me going, hey, "That's you. Can I get rid of my autoimmune disease? How would that affect it?" And well, basically all I I, I could say with with certainty. One probably won't affect it at all because my wife has lupus and gets tattooed all the time, right? Two, um, I don't know because although this headline says what it says, the study is way underpowered statistically, right? And I was just waiting for someone to take the piss on the study. Like we always think scientists, you put stuff out there and you get ripped a new one. Not really. Most of the time people don't give a shit, right? And occasionally you get a lot of press. But most of the time, right, there is an uncritical response to your work, right? And I think this is important for us to recognize. We need to be engaged scientists. We need to be self-critical because the stuff that goes out there often gets amplified to be journalistically clickable, but not necessarily, uh, it doesn't necessarily say things with the power or emphasis that you mean them to, right? So I found an effect, but it's a little bitty effect, right? But because tattoos are so interesting, they went crazy with this. So what do you, what do you, what would you do with something like that? If you got that sort of feedback, what'd you do? All right, thank you for saying the obvious. So. Usually you want someone else to replicate it, right? You want an outside lab to do the same thing or replicate your findings, take your sample. But in lieu of that, you just you you do it. It's your it's your project, right? So I had the opportunity in 2016 to go to American Samoa when the Zika outbreak happened and saw that tattooing was still super, super popular there. And I found out, um, I didn't know it at the time, but I found out that among uh, cultures of the world, Samoa is one of the few that has an uninterrupted practice, right? There was a colonial and missionary effort to suppress it. There was a diminishing of tattoo, the, the practice, but it never fully went away, right? And it looks like this, right? This is uh, Amalu on the left, female Amalu, and this is the payoff, 
on the right. And this takes four to eight hours. How long? How long? <laughs> how long does it take? Uh, six. six, all right. And this is like 32, 35 hours with someone decent, right? Could be longer. Really, and they have to be done in one sort of like period of time, right? So in other words, you don't take months off and come back, right? You go you, over a few days, you get it done, right? An unfinished payout is mutu, right? You don't want an unfinished payout, right? When people have the ceremonies, right, that I showed you, everybody who is Sangamiti who has one of these tattoos is going to tuck there and a lot of lava's in and, and show it, right? It be, it's a ceremonial piece related to cultural values and practices. Right, so you have a, a tattoo that is completely different in almost every respect I can think of from the way we think of tattoos in the United States, right? Um, and so it gives me one the opportunity to study uh, tattoos that are being applied that take a long, long time. So really intense on the immune system. I mean, imagine getting 30 something hours of tattooing and then you finish with this in your belly button, right? Mm -hmm. And while you're getting the tattoo, you cannot uh, drink alcohol, you sleep on the mats. These mats, you can really sleep on the mats. You got yours in one day. Yeah, I slept on the mats this summer. We slept on the mats this summer. We had bruised hips, but we're not used to it, right? Um, you, um, you know, you have a lot of, of, prescriptions and prohibitions. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about this in just a second, given time. But what this tattoo does is not make you a cool tattoo person. It makes you a Samoan in, this, in the truest cultural sense of the word, because what Samoans value more than anything is service to the community, to the family, right? Your well-being, uh, is is your family and your extended family, I should say, in your village. Uh, you looking cool means nothing, right? This means that you have been, you're, you're of service to the family and that's what it symbolizes, right? When people see it, they see it as uh, you have been of service and have been given permission and supported it probably in getting this, maybe even been paid for, by the chiefs or the chief's son in the in the in the truest traditional sense of it. The chief's son would get this and arrange for it and pay for the the untitled uh cousins and men associated with the chief's son would, would also get them, right? So you usually have multiple going on at one time. I think this the what one of the ones Mike and I saw the year before last when we were in Hawaii, there were eleven of uh, these that were cranked out in like seven days. It was just insane. So we replicated this initial study in American Samoa. I'm gonna speed up. We refined some of our methodology. This is how we um, standardize the tattoo experience variable by having people fill in on these charts where their tattoos are and how big they are. We don't care what the design is, but using this, how big they are, and then for each one, we go approximately how many hours did it take or how long did it take for that one. So we can develop standardized units and then uh, add or do a ratio based on the number that are in our chart. And so we get a standardized number that we use. Uh, here I show you the, 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 the regression, and this chart shows you the pre and the post. Right, and again, what we see is low tattoo experience, high tattoo experience. The high tattoo experience group had an elevation from pre to post in IGA again. Now, this study supports the first study, but again, it's it's actually this was a small sample as well. That one was twenty nine. This one was twenty five. That one was mostly women from the south, U.S. South. This was a mix of Polynesian and uh, people from. Uh, U.S. tourists who were there. So it still wasn't the sample size that we wanted. Fortunately, while we were there, we got invited to be the official scientists at the Northwest Tatao Festival in 2017 in Seattle. So we did it again. Bigger sample size. This just came out last year. Um, 55 people 
at a festival uh, in like one day or day and a half. And the way we we did this one, instead of recording the time the, the time the whole tattoo took, because we wouldn't know when the tattoo was finished, we would just collect the saliva sample at the beginning and then an hour in for everyone. So we would go back in an hour. And I want you to take a look at these, right? So if you know anything about p-values, what you see over there when you look, even though these, these numbers are different, right? Cortisol pre to post, right? You see a slight elevation, but it is statistically not just not significant, it's not even close. <laughs> same thing with IgA, same thing with C-reactive protein, which we were also looking at for inflammation. But when we add back in the other variables, like tattoo experience, right? Well, uh, you can see it right there, but wait for it. We still get the same robust effect, right? When we add in tattoo experience. So the tattoo experience is definitely mediating uh, something to do, something with the immune system, right? So this is all new stuff I've added in, right? Do those circulating levels reflect immunological activity? So this one is cool because, as I said, we're collecting saliva, even though someone might be getting a tattoo over here, right? Or here, right? You're getting a tattoo in your ass cheek, the pain is here. But this, this Alangi uh, scientist, this white guy scientist, is collecting saliva from your mouth, right? Why? So we wanted to know if those levels reflect actual immunological activity. And so we used a new assay developed by Michael Newell and Brian Baylor for looking at actual bacteria killing activity in the sample, right? So what they do is we take the sample and we add a known amount of E. coli to the sample. And then after a certain specified period of time, you look at that again to see how much of the E. coli is being killed by the immunofactors that are in that sample, right? So again, when we look at bacteria killing activity in the sample, we see a beneficial effect of bacteria killing the people who have more tattoo experience, right? which I just think is super neat. And then we, uh, in 2018, I went to Samoa. Uh, so I should note, for those of you unfamiliar, there is Samoa and there is American Samoa. And as we, 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 we so enjoyed this summer uh, traveling between them, because we have a very, very I'll just say the international dateline, which used to be over here on the western side of Western Samoa, got moved in 2011. They just took a box and went eep, 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 and moved Western Samoa over to the Pacific sphere so that you're 18 hours ahead uh, in one island and you're big. 24 hours, 24 hours? I get confused, 12 hours? I can't even, I can't even get it right. So trying to get ferry tickets to go back and forth between the two islands was a nightmarish, right? So anyway, so so we're in, uh, this time, Western Samoa. What is special about Western Samoa is um, the main families who have protected uh, the practice. The Sulawabe family is, is the primary family, there are two, primary guilds, there's kind of three, they're in a cultural tussle right now uh, over sort of the historiography of this, but there is, there's a guild system uh, and chiefs whose role it is to protect and to transmit this cultural knowledge, right? So the two main families are the Sua family and the Tuloina family, and the Sua family titles are held by the Suluape family. So the Sulawatne family are world famous, right? Just to give you a sense of what I mean by that, they consult on the Moana films and all the tattoos that are in them, right? Dwayne Johnson is, they all, like, all know each other. They're all, they're all from Leai, the Leai, that this community, I keep, there is, there is a Samoan friend in the back who I keep looking to for, for help. So it's in Hawaii, it's in Oahu, it's a Samoan community there and a lot of, uh, the diaspora of Samoans are from that area. So you're talking about both family and so on and so forth. Not that neighborhood necessarily, but that island. 
So um, go, we went to Western Samoa to look at uh, the, the Pea and the Malu and how getting that intense tattoo would affect the immune system. And when you go there, they they have a, a, a folly set up in the village in town where they're just cranking out tattoos all day long, right? So we did a case study of immune response to traditional hand tap tattooing. This is in uh, we're this is in pre in prep right now. Uh, the first author is an undergrad in my lab. I just love Alex is a rock star and is a great writer. This is going to be the third publication they will have been on in my lab. Um, uh, this this these, this is his father. You can see he modified his Puke tattoo, his belly button tattoo. Uh, but this family, where they're getting all their uh, tattoos, and what was amazing is he's covered, and his brother was the one who wanted to get the pay on. His brother had no tattoos and didn't like needles. And so these guys got their tattoos and got me feeling a little cocky, right? Like, oh, I mean, I've never had one, and so how much could this possibly hurt? Oh my God, I have never felt that kind of pain. It felt like, because I realized as it started happening, I've got a lot of tattoos, but as it started happening, and someone's doing this, <laughs> I realized I've never had a tattoo that was pounded into me. So I'm just like, and I'm laying there, and I'm gonna, uh, I'm laying there, and I'm, we're outside, and there's flies are landing on my face. And I'm like, and there's geckos on the lights up there. And this was one gecko, it's, it's kept twitching its tail. And I'm like, oh my God, stop twitching your tail. And it twitched its tail and it kept like having a sympathetic twitch. And it's a phone guy that the artist kept looking at me going, you okay? I'm like, oh, it's the gecko. <laughs> right? So it's, it's, it's impressive, right? So I just want to show you just a little bit like what, what we're looking at. We're trying, we have no idea how the bodies respond to such intense stress. Nobody's ever studied this. So this will be a purely descriptive study that we hope to sort of understand how these biomarkers are responding to this day. I can't quite wrap my brain around what you're seeing right now, but it looks cool, right? Yes, okay. So we're just gonna move on from there. Okay, so 10 minutes. So I'm gonna now shift to the other, the other one, right? So do tattoos improve health? That's what I just looked at. That was the natural selection hypothesis. The phenotypic gambit was one of the titles you see in there. Phenotypic gambit, something you see widespread or universal. It may not necessarily be coded for biologically, but you can assume if it's that universal, there's something underneath it that is coded for. That's the gambit. And so that's what we call it a honing process, right? But tattoos are also cool. People get them to look more attractive and one would assume um, that there might be some sort of sexual selection uh, element there. So that was the other one of the other studies that we have done, and we did this study here. So I'll quickly tell you about this. This was a study we did using a short survey here uh, about 10 years ago. I don't think anybody here was part of it, but basically I sent a survey that was, it took five minutes to complete, asked people if they had tattoos, piercings, um, if they had any medical complications related to either of them, and if they're an intercollegiate athlete, because we wanted to look at the, uh, uh, a phenotypically robust group. Like, in other words, like the question was do fit people get tattoos to advertise their fitness, or do less people get tattoos to maybe accommodate things they feel are not as great about themselves, right? Now, so we're, we're still sort of wrestling with, I think it's probably both, right? Um, but earlier research had found relationships between tattooing and bilateral symmetry, meaning people who are more symmetrical, which is a, a, a proxy of attractiveness and health, tended to tattoo more. So we wanted to test that. So we, we sent this survey out to all, at the time, 30,000 undergraduates here at the University of Alabama. And the coolest part about this study is that I could do that because it's not perfect protected. So I could. I can request them from the registrar, load them into Qualtrics, and send a survey to everyone. And since I loaded it into Qualtrics, send them to people who didn't know this. And, and automate that like three times. So I got a sample of 6,500. Um, I was looking for uh, collegiate athletes 
And at first I was disappointed at the number because I thought this is like Alabama is like college athlete central. How many college intercollegiate athletes do you think we have on this campus of 30 to 40,000 undergraduates? 1,200 is up around what I thought too, or even more. It's only 500, right? And I, I we got 250. So I was like, holy shit. At first I thought, oh my God, we didn't get anything. And then I looked up the numbers. Okay, so what did we find? Um, we found the only relationship with tattooing was by gender, right? So doing, uh, 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 so males, males were driving this. Um, there was no relationship with anything uh, to do with piercing except gender. Um, and we did include ears, so that kind of threw that one off. Um, and But here's what I want to show. Let me unveil this over here. So from an evolutionary perspective, what, what does this tell us? Well, we could, because we ask them for their height and weight, we can calculate BMI. And although athletes will, we, we cannot distinguish between muscle mass and fat mass when we look at BMI. We can divide people up by uh, CDC quartiles, right? So on the bottom is our athletes, on the top is our non-athletes. So what we see over here is that most people with tattoos have the healthy, normal body type, but the medical complications occur mostly among the non-athletes and mostly in the groups with uh, the, the larger body type. So what does that suggest? It suggests that there is a cost to signaling whatever it is you're signaling. If you, if you expose yourself to something that could undermine your health, uh, you may actually undermine your health if you're not healthy, right? If you are healthy, your body can't rebound from it. That is the suggestion here, only a suggestion, because this is a fraught area of research, and there is plenty of data out there indicating that large body types can have healthy fat as well. So we want to be really careful about that, but in terms of looking at evolutionary models, this is one way uh, to frame this. Okay, I have a few minutes left. So the, the, the upshot of the sort of empirical studies so far is that tattooing does influence the immune system and it probably also highlights pre-existing fitness. We know many, a lot of our cultural behaviors, a lot of our genetics, a lot of our biology, it all does multiple things. That's what makes it so interesting and so hard to study. You can tell this used to be my concluding thing. So here's some future directions that I'm gonna tell you about in the next slide, getting a better sense of how the mechanisms interact. That was actually that previous one. A uh, ceiling of the benefits of extensive tattoo. That's what I'm looking at right now. How significant is the role of appraisal? That's what I'm gonna tell you about in just a second. And then the impacts of different styles of tattooing. This is something that is not explored yet. And I throw this out there because we have lots of things for grad students to do if they wanna get involved in tattoo research. So let me uh, finish up with a few of the other directions we, we've gone with this. So this is a paper that we did uh, looking at the stigma associated with tattooing. And what we found was that all of the stigma that we associate today with tattooing probably derives from this period in the late 19th century when a couple of sociologists, uh, criminologists, were trying, they, they were using prisoner tattoos and soldier tattoos to develop a taxonomy try to associate their tattoo styles and their number of tattoos with disorders and um, with deviance. And it was a complete failure. But the fact that they published a lot about this, it, it got out there. And just because something does not have empirical validity doesn't mean fake news, the world won't believe it, right? So we did this study and literally we saw uh, the types of studies that are coming out in psychology tracked with the history of the discipline itself, right? So when, the, his, when the, the discipline, the major focus of the discipline was on abnormal psychology, they were focused on finding relationships between tattooing and abnormal psychology or abnormal psychology and other things. Most recently, social psychology developed and has diversified enough that they now have studies looking at the, the acceptability of tattoos based on your occupation which are way better because they actually show that, yeah, if you want to be a barista or a bouncer, get tatted up. It's going to be cultural capital. If you're going to be an accountant, maybe wear long sleeves for a while. You know, you know those kinds of sensical things, right? So granularity. Last summer when we couldn't get to Samoa, 
Uh, Mike from Tam and I went to Hawaii. I just want to show you a little bit about what we found. Every single field season is like peeling the layer of the onion off. It just blows my mind, right? So what we learned when we were there was how the economy of Samoan and Polynesian tattoo works and swirls around Samoa through Hawaii. And um, basically there's a, the, the node or the central nexus is the Suluwape family, the old man as they call him, the high chief Sua, Suluwape Aliva'a Patelo. I would explain to you that name, but it would add 15 minutes. Uh, but what I will say is this is uh, Peter Suluwape, sort of the heir apparent or the oldest of the kids uh, who tattoo. And these three are tosos or stretchers, right? And they have just completed a Sama ceremony. So they are showing, uh, they're, they're, they were just dancing, which is why they are dressed that way. And this is uh, right at the, uh, the closing ceremony of the Tatao Marks of Distinction exhibit at the Bishop Museum in Honolulu last summer. And they just they had a huge ceremony and were dressed in traditional uh, garments for it. So I got a great picture of them. And but what is also so cool in Hawaii is that Samoan tattooing is distinctive and oldest, but it's not the only tradition in the Pacific. Uh, many of the traditions in the Pacific actually owe their current practice to the persistence of Samoan Tatao because the Tafunga or the, the cultural practitioners from Samoa trained other Polynesians on how to make the tools. And then they have worked with their own elders and with anthropologists. In fact, Tricia Allen is a Wahine, a Haile Wahine or a white lady uh, in Hawaii who is one of the foremost experts from an anthropological perspective on Polynesian tattooing in the world, because she's worked with so many different groups and worked with groups as they are revitalizing their practice and has introduced sanitary and hygienic uh, methods and training to them. So in reintroducing uh, the people of Rapa Nui to their, to their own patterns, because they could not access uh, native, Natives of Rapa Nui at the time were not allowed to check out books in their own libraries uh, they weren't if they weren't students, so they couldn't access the anthropological text with their patterns in them. So she took their patterns to them. She showed them how you can use pressure cookers to sanitize equipment, how you can use uh, uh, water bottle caps uh, to hold tattoo ink, uh, keep it sanitary and clean, use plastic bags, uh, just like shortcuts to reduce uh, bloodborne infections. Uh, she's trained a lot of folks. Um, in Hawaii, there is a really, really significant movement of cacao, right? Cacao, tatao. Tatao is the word from which tattooing comes from. It's a Polynesian word meaning to do what is right, to do what is expected, or to, to strike, right? All their words have multiple meanings. Um, and uh, so you, you see tatao in Tonga, in Tahiti, and in Samoa and other places, uh, tuck and cut, they're the same sound. They did not have a written language when uh, missionaries arrived. And so either from the translation or just a natural linguistic change that happens over time, the cut and the tuck, because they're so close in the mouth, switch. So tatao and cacao are the same thing. Uh, in Hawaii, the patterns vary based on your genealogy and family uh, story. So these are all different, as you see, uh, than the Samoan ones. And um, there's actually a video here, but I won't. Well, this video just is embarrassing for this guy. Wait, let's go ahead and watch it. It's not only embarrassing if you've seen Samoans tap. Look how slow he is. Could take forever. Anyway, so uh, this is calling him to tell. Uh, he was trained by Sulawate, so there's actually a close affinity. And Tonga used to, uh, even after they outlawed tattooing, they, they would go to Samoa to get all their tattoos done and, and the pay is very similar. Um, so I just have a few minutes left. I want to share with you a few sort of upshots of this research and where we are now. On my way back from that 2017 field season, I wrote this for the conversation. This was a, a short public piece just about the research, and it got published and immediately picked up by CNN 
And I show you this is a dashboard that goes with Conversation Sapiens has a similar dashboard. And uh, this this is a humble brag. Just look at this number. This is how many times it's been viewed, right? Um, and that was in two weeks because it got picked up by CNN. So uh, 700,000 people, I can guarantee you, is more than I've ever read everything else I've done combined, right? Um, so that is a major way to sort of like reach the public. But also one of the things that I wanted to say is when I got the grant um, during COVID, it was difficult to get the research started. So we went to Hawaii, but then ultimately, and, and one of the messages I have is, I know it's, it's expensive. It's difficult for us to do this. And as a department and as a college and as a discipline, one of the things we, we, we're trying to work on is making funding available for people to go to their field sites and meet people and develop the site. Because until I went there and talked to them, even though I had money for it, I would not have been comfortable arriving and expecting people to fall into place and give me data, right? So in, this is my like, giving fancy talk shirt um, and, uh, and roll tie in Friday before game day, so you got to roll tie. So I went to Samoa over spring break, $3,000 for six days in like three meetings. And I met people who loved ideas and gave me new ideas. So I met collaborators and it made it possible then to return this summer. Then you see Josh and I and Grant is off to the side. Uh, Leota is our, uh, he is a, a chief. Uh, Matai Tulawale, uh, he's talking chief in his village. He's got the payoff, you can see. So he's gone through the experience and he's a linguist studying uh, uh, with a master's degree, teaching at the university. So he's like, all he, he understands our world and he understands that world. And he became our first our sort of cultural guide and liaison, but then ultimately collaborator. Uh, we were doing an interview with this guy here and he's an untitled guy who was bringing this Kava. So we've got Kava sitting there uh, that we were uh, partaking of. And what we learned, in the course of this piece, uh, obviously this is, this is where I'll end, but what we did this summer, we, we barely were hanging out with the tattoo artist this summer. The idea this summer was um, to put the tattoo or the tattoo, right, in cultural context, right? If the tattoo is a shared marker of identity, then we would expect well-being to be enhanced by someone wearing the tattoo. And so what we're doing is exploring how important is that to cultural identity? And what we found out through the course of the free listing of pile sword activities that we did is tattoo is an indicator of service. And there are many, many types of service, but the ethos of Samoanness is, as I said earlier, to be of service to your family and service to your community. Your well being is secondary to your family and your extended community's well being. If you are successful in life, yes, you worked hard, but that is a given. It's because of your service. You were of service. Maybe you took care of your elders. Maybe you donated property to the church. Maybe like those things result in blessings. And your success is a blessing. Because you can work hard and not have it result in anything. There are often failures. So as we studied the Tatao, everyone agreed that the Tatao is important and all the chiefs that had them, or that we had to work with, all covered with Tatao. But they rarely talk about it. They talk about service constantly. So that's where we are now uh, next year. Uh, we have to go back. When I say we, it's me and whoever the hell I can put my name and going with me. So love this talk. And uh, we'll be collecting the biomarkers to test the relationship between the sort of cultural model that we were exploring this time and wearing to tau. If it actually, if living up to those internalized values results in health benefits that we can measure. And then we have social media. <laughs> I was in the window watching the whole time. <laughs> I saw that article and seen it. Well done, well done. All right, question. Yes, so do you see any correlations between identity tattoos and like 
um, let's say like military service, like how do those cross walk between warrior cultures? And we haven't asked about that here. Um, we were looking at the relationship between tattooing and military when we were exploring tattooing and sports. We were going to do a similar study uh, between looking at the, the military uh, and how it inculcates a sense of group unity. But the people that were doing that study graduated and left, so we don't have those data. But that actually is, when we were thinking about fit individuals who get tattooed, it was athletes in the military. And we knew with the, with the military or with athletes, uh, if we did it here, most people that we would be measuring it would be within a narrow age range and would minimize some of the variability. Uh, but it's still in the, the plate. So thank you for mentioning this. Sorry about this this earlier, but um, how is it that you measure the uh, tattoo experience? So we asked people <coughs> how many tattoos, the first time we did it was what, how many tattoos do you have? How many tattoo sessions have you had? How many hours had you did each tattoo take? The total hours tattooed and extent of the body tattooed, right? So that was really raw and unsystematized the first time. The second time we added in that chart, that diagram, that body diagram, so we could have the extent of the body would be standardized in units. And what we found out was the index when we combined all of those. Uh, variables when it created one indexical variable, it kind of was messy. Um, oh, the other one was age, your age when you got your first tattoo. And we were trying to see if the length of time that you've been tattooed had an effect, but we weren't measuring how many tattoos you got, like what was the density in that period, right? So that's one of the things we left out. What we ultimately discovered is the extent of the body and the hours were the main drivers of tattoo experience. So, and those are pretty, those, the hours is the hardest one because you just basically have to go from tattoo to tattoo and ask people how many hours it took. And I, I, I would fail that. I don't, I don't know, most of them. Especially because sometimes you have someone who is professional and fast, and other times you have someone, I tattooed myself, and I was really slow, it took me hours and hours and hours, and I was doing one, one single needle at a time, right? Completely different. Also, it didn't hurt at all when they did it that way. So you have to, like, there's, there's this is the first time this has been studied. And if you, sh shifting away from electric tattooing to hand tat, I sort of question the methodology and then see people using the stitching type. I'm not sure if that has the same sort of, you know, so in other words, there's a lot of granularity that we have left laying on the sides, <laughs> there's not enough research out there on this yet to be able to know if the way we're measuring it is the best way, if that makes sense. It's a good question, I appreciate it. Yes. Um, so I was just thinking like in America, it can cost a lot of money to get a lot of tattoos. And I wondered if that plays any role in SMOA and like their accumulation or how they go about getting more tattoos. Yeah, that's a huge issue actually, because it's actually even more expensive. Because not only are you paying for the tattoo, your whole family is coming with you. So getting a tattoo is not, like no one goes to get a malu or pay up by themselves. And if they do, they shouldn't. One, it's a cultural experience. It's a change in status. It's not just a tattoo. So you're being vetted by someone. Also, it's, it's a privilege for your entire family. And it, it elevates everyone. So everybody wants to be part of it. So that, that family that was there, that I showed you, there were uh, two brothers and a sister and an aunt getting tattooed, but also a little sister and the father came. And a lot of times it would be like one or two people and then three or four other people. I was, actually, when I was in Hawaii, there, were, there was a guy from Georgia get tattooed and his family from Alaska had come in. And not only are they coming in, they're feeding everyone. We need, right? Every day they're bringing like 20 takeout boxes for lunch. And then at the Sama, the ceremony at the end, it's just like cases of tuna, cases of whiskey, cases and money, cash. I'm just like, do you have a special room for all the whiskey? And it's like, I should have one. You want a bottle of whiskey? I'm like, sure. Right? So, yeah, it's really expensive. Um, 
And I, so to me, like all of that is signaling. You know, my interest from an evolutionary perspective is in signaling, it's signaling commitment. Like the tattoo, the pain and the endurance is one signal, so is the money. And then so is the expectation of service at the end. So. I think I can help answer the question about like the numbers part. So for like the model, it would be this number, and then for the men, like the L would be five grand. And then usually, like throughout that, you know, as you said, you have to bring food on like certain days, and you're not just feeding like yourself or your family. You're feeding like the people who are and like the households. So you're feeding like everybody. And then at the end for the summer, you gotta give like money to the people who are, and then you also gotta like bring gifts as well. So honestly, it would be like a good tender <laughs> you're looking at it. For one person. For one person. For the model. Yeah. Um, you want to see what your mom role was? Why you why you know so oh. much? Hi, everybody. <laughs> my name is Data Tumble by Law. I'm from Honolulu, Hawaii. My mom was actually the manager of Suwaki, and she was a manager for eleven years. And so that's why I know so much about like the Malu, the uh, and I also have a Malu, uh, but um, it's very like a custom that like we don't show it. Even though you see me a lot of times at the gym with my shorts on, ignore that. <laughs> and if you see me walking around on campus, ignore that. <laughs> but it's very culturally like, you know, you keep it very sacred to you know, us as women and such. But you know, that's who I am. So this is a great talk. So her mom has been one of our main like informants and helped us out so much. And like it's it's her uh grandmother's house where we went last summer and watched so much of this getting done. So cast on my regards to, to your family. I love them. It was such an honor to be there. And the biggest regret I have about my project is that I, I wrote it up so that I'm spending most of my time in Samoa. Because now I want to spend it in on a little bit. It's really, it's really, it's really uh, really great, really fun. Other questions? Right on. Yes. Um, back in your chart where you had the student as the student to the student questionnaire, mm -hmm. it looked to me, and maybe I wasn't getting the chart right. It looked to me like athletes were less likely to have tattoos. Depends on the athlete. No, that was the same. Uh, the athletes and the non-athletes were statistically the same unless you did the gender by gender interaction. Uh, and then there were males. There were certain sports that had higher rates of tattooing. Anyone want to guess? Uh, yeah, I got a lot of football players out of leagues and then swimmers. Yeah. Which I've done as things. <laughs> yes. Other questions. So with anthropology's history with Samoa yeah. and you working there now, how have you like had that conversation with yourself? Like, what do you work with and the connections you've got with scholars? Um, do you have any tips for incoming anthropologists and the whole working? That's a great question. So Samoa's been studied to death, and that was my fear, right? So we like we have a his our department has a, a role at Samoa, right? So I replaced Jim Bindon. I don't know if anyone's heard of Jim Benden. You may have met him. He just just moved uh, to Fairhope this summer to be closer to his grandkids. He used to have a house here, taught the race class. Uh, looks like an old hippie. Is an old hippie from San Francisco. Um, he was part of the uh, Paul Baker, uh, the, the second human adaptability program, like major series of studies when they were trying to understand how human variation like exists happens, like how humans adapt to extreme environments. So the first Baker group did high altitude studies in Peru. The second Baker group did migration studies comparing in the 70s Western Samoa to American Samoa because the health differences and the, the access to fast food and all that kind of stuff was so different then, right? So we have this long history of being there. And one of the biggest issues has been because of that and because of the metabolic studies that have been going on, Samoans and Polynesians have been fetishized as these sort of like archetypes of this uh, people who traveled across uh, the Pacific and through that travel, uh, they may have been selected for uh, uh, preserving or like putting on calories better to make, you know, the sort of thrifty phenotype hypothesis, right? Um, and in fact, there is an obesity problem in the Pacific and many other cultures 
And when you go there, you see why this the, the availability of food. They're they're food deserts, right? They don't have access to their traditional uh, foods. They've been replaced by fast food and fried food and, and all of that kind of stuff. So there, there are tons and tons of people going in there and studying them from negative perspectives, which as you can imagine, much as occurs here in the black belt, right? People studying you to death without helping you pisses people off. So the first time we were there, we were studying Zika, we were actually um, confronted by the current senator of American Samoa. She was there. We did not even know she was the senator. She wasn't the senator at the time, but I recognized her. And she confronted us for being helicopter researchers because she thought we were someone else. She's like, you people from blank. And I'm like, oh, I don't know who those people are. I'm going to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> and we just sat there and took the sort of chastising. But what it said to us is they want, if, it's okay to do research. One, tell us what you found. And two, don't just come collect some data and leave again, right? Spend some time getting to know us. So when people go, oh, like this summer, I was so proud. I was in Samoa and these guys are getting tattooed. And I'm talking, and I've been there so many times that like when I walk by, uh, they, they look up and they're like, come on over. And I'm like, I'll proud of myself. I can walk over and sit down. And then um, they're like, oh, you know, somebody was like, oh, uh, you want to know American Samoa? Have you been there before? I was like, sure, sure. Like, oh, he's he's been he's been back and forth a bunch of times. I'm like, yeah, I've been here five times and there two times. They're like, oh my god, this is my first. I grew up in American Samoa. This is my first time in Samoa, right? So, but that means something, right? Because you spend time there, you got to know people. Um, they're not big islands. You can you can explore them relatively easily, but um, getting back and forth is is difficult. But putting in time. You know, going to Savaii, uh, which is what we did this summer, spending time in the rural areas, um, eating what people eat, sleeping where people sleep, and then the 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 talk that I went and gave, where I was, because a lot of people were like, oh, you know, we can't come to Samoa because it costs too much. Can we just Zoom? I mean, you guys hate Zooms, right? They're gone. Right? Um, nobody wants to Zoom. And it's an 18-hour difference, right? So the fact that I went there and was willing to spend that grant money to go and get time and, and just had like that meant a lot. And that's why I showed that that because that trip in March made this summer the most amazing. I need to tell the, the upshot, I need to tell the, the, the great part. So uh when we went to Savai'i, we got a we got an office ceremony, which is this major uh sort of like you're under our protection. It's, just, it's an honor bestowed on dignitaries. And they decided that I were trustworthy and they want to uh, give me a chief title when I go back, which means they all know how to address me and also gives me some clout. And the easiest way I can compare the, 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 the easiest way I can explain this, which is kind of embarrassing, is to say, it is why most Samoans think that what Derek Friedman wrote about Samoa is more true than what Margaret Mead wrote. One, Margaret Mead wrote about sex, which is <laughs> right, but two, uh, she's a woman uh, working in a remote area, staying in a Christian household, and working with kids, young girls. And then Derek Friedman was working with adults and chiefs, and it was a male and had a chief title, right? So in the cultural frame, his word had more clout and still does. And so on the one hand, I'm a little like, oh, do I want to manipulate the system? But on the other hand, everyone is aware of who I am. It's not like I'm a past for Samoan. And they know that I did not grow up there. And they know that the chief title is being given to me for this purpose because the word professor means almost nothing. Right? And they want to know how I fit in. What's my status? So if I give them a title, they'll be like, oh, okay. And then they'll know how to address me. And then that will become my first name. And I can put it legally on my birth certificate. That's pretty fucking cool. No, it's not even. I'm going to have it on my door. And you're all going to call me doctor, whatever. Or do we go title and then doctor or doctor and then title? I've seen it both ways. 
I've seen a couple leaking doctors. Definitely goes first. What? Definitely goes first. I think so. Because doctor, people just go, oh, you're not a real doctor, are you? Like that kind of thing. Right? So, but from a chief, their kids, they don't know anything. The kids say, you're not a real chief, are you? No, I don't care like that. But yeah, so so that that's the kind of, you know, like that that's taken me years. And that's sort of the rub with anthropology is it's a slow discipline. It's like the slow food movement, right? Build work takes time, but it fucking pays off. Sorry for the, the French. The French people in their heads. It's just shop it, shop it, what's that? <laughs> All right, I think I'm running out of, uh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> I'll see you all there. Thank you all for a uh, great turnout and great questions and attention. Thank you. 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 Thank you.